we have the top number of cases in Asia and rabies. And to give you a fact, is that to give you a fact, we have been uh, having 200 to 300 Philippine death cases just due to rabies. And so we still eat uh, uh, dogs as part of our food, but we really have to understand the virus and what's its effect in the public. Very recently from 2019, we had an outbreak of African swine fever virus, and it has devastated the pig uh, industry in the Philippines. Right now, uh, we have over 2,000 local or barangays that have been, uh, that have reported outbreaks of ASFD. I'm a veterinarian myself, and so this, uh, Knowing this news in my country is quite really devastating. Although we have uh, vaccines for missiles, polio, and polio recently as well, there are re-emerging cases of missiles and polio that has been reported in the Philippines. And we still have the Ebola reston virus. It is not a pathogenic uh, Ebola strain, but we still have this. So these are, there are a lot other of other viruses that we have and that we have to think about in the Philippines, not just SARS-CoV-2. But today, actually, I would like to give you uh, a bit, another perspective of viruses. So the aims of my lecture is really to see the big picture of virology to be able to understand that virology is not just a collection of viruses and viral diseases, but it's more of an integrative discipline. So we have to understand from my case, I try to understand how viruses interact with hosts, how the host innate immune response respond to virus infections. What are the differences in the population that allows it, them to be more susceptible? So it's, there's more about viruses, it's not just viruses. And also to learn the basic concepts on viruses, such as the definition, classification, structure, replication cycle, and infection and transmission. The last two, I'll be uh, discussing this uh, more in my next lecture on Friday. So we actually live in prosper in literal cloud of viruses. Viruses infect all living things. Bacteria, phytoplankton, every human deal with viruses on a day-to-day -day basis, but we don't get infected. And that is important to know. We regularly eat and breathe billions of virus particles. And we even carry viral genomes as part of our own genetic material. So the number of viruses on Earth is staggering. Just take, for example, a bacteriophage. So a bacteriophage is a, a virus that infects bacteria. In on Earth, there are 10 to the 30 yet power of bacteriophage particles in a rose water. And if you take a spoonful, each bacteriophage has a size of 10 to the minus 15. So very, very small. So the biomass of, of bacteriophages on the planet is actually 1,000 times heavier than an elephant. And if you try to line up all bacteriophages from head to tail, you'll, it's a fact that it equates to 100 million light years, which is equivalent to a distance until Pluto. Okay. Also, as I have said, humans get infected with viruses, whales get infected with viruses. Um, over the years, I have been studying enteric viruses, and in particular, our viruses. When I was in Korea, I've been trying to study 
uh, calicy viruses in pigs. And these are viruses that cause gastroenteritis in pigs. But we're, later, we're trying to understand the viruses in pigs to understand the viruses in humans. But whales also get infected with calicy viruses. Because of calicy viruses, whales can get rashes, blisters. They can even have gastroenteritis. And as well as uh, its effect in humans, calicy viruses, as I've said, uh, causes gastroenteritis. But the thing is, when infected whales excrete calicy viruses, they can excrete on a daily basis with 10 to the 13 power. And 10 to the 13 is, that means 13 zeros. So it's more than millions of virus particles on a daily basis. So there is really a lot of virus particles. And one of the uh, important message that I really want to get through to you today is to think of the virus not just as the carrier of the bad news. I know that our interest on viruses is really because they have cost our lives, they have cost deaths to our families, of our friends, lost jobs, but equally viruses are very important microorganisms on Earth. And here's another fact. A liter of coastal seawater that, is, that carries viruses is more than the number of people on Earth. So if you see here, while the biomass is more of prokaryotes, actually, if we're looking at abundance of each virus particle, there's more viruses in there. And viruses has played a role in the turnover of sulfur, phosphorus, and carbon. And these are this means viruses have played as catalysts for biochemical cycling. And this is important to make the earth livable. This here is just a picture of uh, phantoms. So, and this was actually captured uh, on a, uh, a, in space because when virus infects uh, phytoplanktons and they die, they release uh, organic matters. And this gets captured on space. So another the information is, as I have said, there is over or around 10 to the 16 HIV genes on planet today. And actually the virus is an endemic virus. And the Philippines as well um, have been trying to deal with this. And the problem with this is when there is so much virus, and especially for HIV, curing HIV has been very difficult. Right now, there are almost uh, 30 drugs that is being given to an HIV patient. But because it has different uh, subgenomic, uh, uh, because the, 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 the virus forms resistance and, and up to now, it has been reported they can, it has built resistance to over 30 drugs. So once a, a, a patient gets HIV, you really have to check whether they are already or not yet resistant to these available drugs. But do we get infected? Definitely, because I have, as I have said, there is an abundant number of viruses around us. Actually, every one of us have herpes simplex virus. Um, one, two, uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein or herpes, uh, uh, human herpes virus, six, seven in there. And once you get infected, you, you get infected for life. And these are viruses that stay with us because they can be latent. And once our immune system is challenged or triggered, then that's when it arises. This one is, for example, is in the form of blister. So I have uh, uh, experience seeing people that when they get too stressed because of schoolwork, they can't have blisters. And this is just due to um, purpose. 
But with recent development of um, sequencing, it has been identified that around our body, there are several DNA and RNA viruses. And this just shows that from skin to digestive tract, blood, our kidneys, our lungs, up to our nervous system, we have DNA and RNA viruses. And as I have said a while ago, there are part of our genome also contains, uh, we carry virus, uh, parts of virus uh, gene, genes. And a very good example of that is the long terminal repeats retrotransmissions. So we, because of us being infected with retroviruses, and retroviruses is a very good way of incorporating the uh, genes in to a host replication uh, cycle in host replicate while the host is replicating its uh, genes. And one reason, and a very good example, is uh, the formation of placenta. And it's been found that, that the gene that allows us to accept the to form the placenta, that allows us the baby to stay for nine months is because of this LTR retrotransposin. And also the short interspersed nuclear elements and long interspersed uh, nuclear elements, some of those uh, uh, components are also, also came from viruses. Um, right now in the world, there are several, the number one cause of that is cardiovascular diseases. And as of 11th of October, COVID stands as already the third cause of death around the world. But there are other uh, infection, uh, virus uh, causes. Uh, there are other diseases that are caused by viruses, such as um, lower respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, HIV, and hepatitis. So it is really important that uh, we know that the viruses can cause diseases, but equally, it's been very important for us. But equally, in both terms, we have to study viruses. And as I have said, the media has made angles on how people better understand. But it is important that when we respond to virus infection, we can respond rationally. We do not get nervous that we will just die, that we, that we cannot fight. We cannot, uh, our immune system will not fight. We should just respond to the virus infection in a net in a rational way. Because it is a fact that the vast majority of in viruses that infect us actually have little or no impact on our health or well-being. In fact, most of the viruses just pass through us. One of the most abundant viruses are plant viruses. And when they when researchers try to uh, look at viruses from cabbage in five different supermarkets in the US, they found that each leaf can have um, over more than million particles of vi pathogenic viruses for cabbage. But they don't have receptors for humans, so we don't get infected. We just it's a lot of the cabbage is usually not washed off. Um, if you look at human faces, human 91% of uh, the sequences that have been found in human faces are actually RNA viruses. And also what they have found that is abundant is a pepper mild virus, which can be 
uh, found uh, over millions of virus particles per gram of a dry leaf. And that is a virus that makes your pepper really ugly and then it's just not saleable. But if you're looking at uh, its effect on humans, it doesn't affect or cause disease to humans at all. There are beneficial viruses. For example, this plant called Dicanthelium lanuginosum. This is a plant that can survive or thrive in very hot environments. And that ability is actually due to fungus. And that ability is not even due to fungus, but due to the virus that infects the fungus. So these are beneficial effects of viruses. In the case of uh, our development of our immune system, in, in mouse, they have found that if you have a, a germ-free mice, as you can see here, these are villi of the intestine. As you can see, quite, they're quite slender and slim. And here, it's just, this is just an Asian E. This is a hematocrine E since of uh, intestine. And this is, the, the, the shape is normal, but it's not as plump as this. And that is because if you look at CD3, and these are markers for immune system, particularly B cells, you can see that there is not much B cells in the germ-free uh, mice intestine. But in mice with a Mirinor virus, there is a much more developed innate immune system. And it can be found here by a positive markers for CD3. And this is quite true for a conventional mice. So this tells us that an enteric virus can actually have beneficial function when there is the absence of commensal bacteria. But equally, uh, our intestinal gut is rich in microbiomes, rich in variants, and they all have different effects, good and bad. So why don't we get infected with the fact that we've put, there are millions of viruses around us? That is because we have an amazing innate immune system. Um, the virus is just entering, they're just entering our skin. We already have a good a skin layer to protect us. And once it's, it enters into a cell, there are a lot of regulatory uh, mechanisms that is being directed against the viruses. The problem is when we have uh, uh, depressed innate immune response or patients that are trying, who have cancer and trying to depress the innate immune response. This is one we have, we, we think, and we see that a patient or somebody can be very vulnerable to virus infections. And this is just a, a map of uh, poliomavirus infection, as you can see, is around the world. It will not even cause any uh, illness to humans. So I thought I'd put my summary as a, a question form and so that I can, I, I can ask, uh, I can make you think of the first parts that I have given. So just try to answer this in your head. Are all viruses make you sick and can be lethal? So this is false. Our immune system can manage, number two, our immune system can manage most viral infections. Yes, that is true. And humans usually are usually infected with one virus at a time. That is false because even for pigs and any animals, there is an infection of several viruses at one time. And the press is usually correct in a virology reporting. This is not true all the time, right? And last.
thing over there is usable. Uh, I said that the most viruses are small, but very recently there are viruses that have been discovered to be larger. And one of those is Mimi virus and Pandora virus. They're large because you can see in a two, uh, this is a, a two, just using your light. Uh, Um, just using your like microscope or electron microscope, you will be able to see uh, this particular viruses. So what are the properties of the viruses? The small size, they usually range from 20 to 700 nanometers. They're obligate intracellular parasites. Uh, the composition of viruses is nucleic acid and protein. Protein is the composition of uh, capsids. Uh, there are sometimes lipid and carbohydrate too, and this is quite true for envelope viruses. They have a, a unique mode of replication. And Tilaok na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit, sa bayan ng aming hati. Tara na, kaibigan, huwag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulong. Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan, sa pamamagay. Okay. Um, we can't hear you, Paul. Hi, Ma Myra. Sorry, but we can't hear you, Po.
to our participants, kindly bear with us as we fix this technical issue for the meantime. Please bear with us as we fix this technical issue. Okay. Hello, Mamaira. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Bo. I'm sorry, how long have you not been hearing me? Um, from the slide yes. of Pandora viruses, as far as I can oh, remember. Okay. <laughs> yeah, ma'am. Okay. I, um, screen share. Yeah, I'll screen share now um, because, um, yeah, I'll try to be quick. Okay. Let's go back. No, that's all right. Oh my God, I'm very sorry. Okay, I will start again. <laughs> I'm using my speaker I'm sorry, now, so ma'am, the next slide. Okay, this one? The next slide, ma'am. This one. Yeah, the evolving concept of virus. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, I'm really very sorry. I think my internet connection is not very stable. I thought I have two options in my hand at the moment, whether to use just a 4G, which also works, but I thought I'll use a Wi-Fi first. Anyway, let's go back and be quick. It's um, okay, ma'am. Okay, so as early as... So there is an evolving concept of viruses, and it actually started in 1978. And people thought that viruses are in liquid form. And virus is definitely a microbe. However, a key event was the Chamberlain filter. And there was one, this is a, a method that was developed to remove bacteria from drink, drinking water. And it was also used by uh, Pasteur and was able to find rabies agents through this. But what I would like to share is that when they were trying to filter uh, tobacco, they were able to find viruses that are much smaller than bacteria. And that's how they were first, that's how tobacco mistake virus was first identified. And that was in 1892. So there are a lot of other viruses that were identified from filtering, and that includes the foot and mouth disease uh, virus, but also they have just identified, they have uh, ident uh, defined that viruses are not just small, but also they replicate in the host, but not in broth. 
and the size is much smaller than 0.2 uh, micron. So through the years, there were a lot of uh, filterable viruses that was discovered from yellow fever virus to influenza virus. But during this time, everyone still knows that virus was just in a liquid form. And this was a, one of the key experiments, uh, how they were able to identify that it is not bacteria. And that is because of how the virus replicate. And I'll be explaining this further in the next slide. So as you can see, uh, there is a very distinct growth patterns of viruses as compared to bacteria. So while bacteria divides instantaneously uh, by fission, uh, division, uh, in, it's not in the case of viruses. So in the case of viruses, once it entered into the cell, it makes its components that is necessary for virus replication. So that is why there is an eclipse period and there is the burst uh, uh, part of the growth curve. And it was not until 1940 when we actually uh, know that or were able to understand that viruses are not, are not in liquid form. Actually, they are particulate matter. And this was just the first EM of bacteriophage in 1939. Uh, the, in this case, the bacteriophage has a, a body and a tail and it's a distinct form. And through the years, we were able to see viruses using EM. Nowadays, we see, uh, we visualize viruses uh, using more advanced technology. But uh, in summary, what this tells us is that viruses come in different or have various morphology. They can be spherical, um, helical, and in the case of um, in the case of bacteriophages, they have a head and a tail. So they can also have an uh, envelope, and some viruses are non-envelope. And the principles of virus structure is not a, a very simple uh, process, okay? This, uh, there is a, when you see a paper or people trying to understand uh, virus uh, morphology, they would say about uh, the axis, um, the symmetry, and that, that is because this is how we define uh, a virus structure. So as I have said, when we try to study virus structures, we either use electron microscopy is just to see the virus and to sort of have an idea of how the virus look like. So a lot of the pictures that I've shown you can, you can clearly see that whether virus is uh, icosahedral, whether there are some protrusions or whether it is helical form. But when you try to look closely into the viral proteins and how they are like arranged in pattern, the symmetry, you scientists use a higher, higher technology such as X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM or cryo-tomography um, and NMR. So in these ways, they're able to study uh, the specific components of proteins and try to understand the, uh, uh, the for example, the different uh, symmetry. So what is important is that a virus particle usually come in a, uh, is usually highly symmetric. And that is because of uh, what they call as genetic economy. Once the virus enter, it must reassemble itself and uh, immediately as well. And that is important for its replication. Mm -hmm. So when you look at virus symmetry, there are like different forms, there's a twofold, threefold, and a screw axis. And I'll be explaining this further in the next slides. 
Um, more importantly, so you'll see that the, a virus can, is composed of non-structural proteins and structural proteins. The functions of structural proteins is really to protect the genome, to allow it to, to assemble in a, in a stable, uh, to allow it to assemble it as a stable protective protein shell. And that is important when um, it is outside the host. And that uh, structure uh, arrangement as well is important for a specific recognition. It identifies what is a specific receptor to allow it to infect into the host. And its interaction with host membranes to be able to penetrate into its target. So once it's inside, it delivers its genome, it opens. So the concept is that uh, the virus structure of a protein is not really firm or not fixed. It's metastable because it has to be firm while it's outside and once it enters, it has to open immediately so that it can release its viral genomes. And so that that information is quite important in trying to uh, identify virus structure. So on your uh, left-hand side is an, an EM uh, resolution of a polyvirus. And the other one is a cryo-EM resolution of a polyvirus. And you can see here a star, which tells the, the, the pentameric uh, arrangement of viral proteins. Um, not very long ago, just uh, when SARS coronavirus was identified in January, Im immediately in February, we were able to uh, define the capsid structure of SARS-CoV-2. And this is very important in um, trying to understand what are the receptors. So actually, this part of the virus is this ribbon structure here. And this is the, uh, the part of the virus that attaches to the receptor. And this is the protrusion that is in here in the memory. And so it is amazing because with this symmetry, the vir once we grow the virus in cell, they just self-assemble itself. And this concept is very important because when we make proteins, they sort of, we can make virus-like particles. This means uh, they form into a virus-like and without the genomic material inside. And that means it is non-infection. And this concept is very important in making um, VLP-based vaccines. Next one is the virus classification. So before, you and you'll recognize that viruses have uh, different uh, names that can be uh, uh, taken from places like, for example, uh, Norwalk virus, um, viruses uh, that are being derived from names who identify them. But as the virus, the number of viruses that are being identified grow, it is important that we are able to classify the virus in a more organized way. And one of these is to uh, classify them according to uh, families and genus. And this is being done by a specific group. So, the classification is based on the nature and sequence of nucleic acid and virus particle, symmetry of protein or the uh, shell or the capsid, or the presence and absence of lipid membrane and the mentions of virus particle. But with the wealth of the sequencing that we're getting in the recent years, we can immediately identify virus classification uh, according to nature and sequence of the nucleic acid. So the virus classification can be seen in ICTV online, 
And whenever we identify new viruses as well, we submit that. And then uh, this group I, helps to uh, uh, identify the right classification. The virus uh, classification is based on the classical hierarchical system, such that there is a kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And you'll know whether you're given an order family just because of the suffixes. So for example, if you the order has a, a suffix of viralis, family is very day and genus. And this, this nomenclature is quite important when you are um, identifying viruses or when you are presenting um, viruses for reporting. So with that, I'd like to give my uh, summary too. Um, and I am giving again in a question form. Um, so viruses assemble using preformed components. Is that true or false? So that is uh, true. They have to have that eclipse period where they uh, for uh, have a preformed components made is a virus translation uh, part of the replication. Viruses replicate in binary fission. This is false because uh, bacteria replicate in binary fission, and that shows with the exponential immediate exponential growth. Viruses replicate in broth. That is false because viruses replicate only in uh, susceptible host cells and then never in broth because they need the machinery to be able to uh, propagate. Viruses were first discovered too large to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. That is false because most of the viruses are actually smaller. One of the main reasons why viruses was discovered was because um, um, it passes through the filter that was used to filter or remove bacteria. And lastly, viruses are classified according to the nature and sequence of the nucleic acid in virus particle. That is true. <laughs> Um, I'm really sorry if I went a little bit ahead of time, but I thank you very much for listening. Much of my slide I've taken from a professor named Vincent Racaniello and also from Professor Ian Goodfellow and the American Society of Viruses. So I'm happy to share with you whatever links or references you would need. And that's really very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Josmilio, for your very informative lecture. I'm sure our participants will come back on Friday for the second part of this webinar. So I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute, or ITDI, Dr. Annabel V. Briones. Good afternoon, Dr. Briones. All right, now for our Q&A, please don't hesitate to ask questions to Dr. Myra about the topic for today. And if you do have one, just type questions in our chat box in this Zoom meeting room. Our viewers from, from Facebook and YouTube live stream may also key in their questions in the comment section so that our moderators can pick them up and be answered by Dr. Hosmilio. I also don't mind having questions from with questions in Tagalog. If that would be very convenient for people to ask in Tagalog, I would also welcome that. All right, so as we wait for the questions from our participants, I would like to ask a question, Dr. Myra. So in the catalog of known viruses, um, I'm wondering if what are more abundant, DNA or RNA viruses? And is there an important reason for that scenario? I think there's both DNA viruses. <laughs> There are more. I, I have a, a a professor beside me that I have been asking. 
<laughs> there are more RNA viruses. And I don't know what's, if there is a reason for cutting the loop. Um, um, so in the earlier forms of life, there are a lot of, of RNA viruses, hence there is more RNA viruses. All right. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Smilio. So I guess we have a lot of questions now from our participants. Okay, so first from Mr. Drexel Camacho. So for the NMR analysis of virus, is it done in solid state or in solution state? Although I have I have performed once in my uh, in years, but I know that it's done in solid state because uh, NMR analysis is actually becomes more beneficial for smaller, very small protein proteins. And so they're quite similar to cryo-EM. They have to be crystallized before they can be uh, studied. So it has to be in solid state. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Meyer. Question is from Willie. Willie Sentinta from Letran. Which is deadlier, viruses or bacteria? Mm -hmm. um, I think both can cause a lot of uh, deaths. Um, the fact that we are able to understand viruses quite well nowadays and makes this, um, it becomes better for us to uh, find ways not to get infected immediately. Like for example, I think really uh, with the plague last time, the reason why we're getting a uh, very significant case fatality rate is because of not uh, lack of knowledge and lack of um, we haven't been exposed. And that would be similar for both viruses or bacteria. So if we've not been exposed for yet to an emerging virus, then we become susceptible. And if we have the receptor, we become susceptible. And that would be similar to bacteria. But actually, if you look at disease or case fatality rate due to infectious pathogens, and that includes viruses and bacteria, it has been significantly reduced over the years just because we have improved sanitation, we have gained uh, a lot of knowledge on diseases and, and pathogenic microorganisms. So I think with that question, I think it would be both for me. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Myra. So another question from Lindley Susie. Is it possible that we originate from viruses? This is actually quite interesting. And I have seen some of the literature which tells that the viruses have evolved before human beings. So we did not originate, but we may have evolved. So there are particles that we have been part that have been part of our genes. So there are, yeah, just part of evolution. I don't think we just originated from viruses, but yeah, a lot of our genes have evolved from viruses. Okay, thank you again for that, Dr. Myra. So we are getting a lot of requests of questions from our participants. So I'm seeing another one from. Trisha of CLSU. Her question is, is it possible for viruses like bacteriophage to be used as an alternative to antibiotics to prevent bacterial infection? Yes. Yes, yes, this is true. Um, recently, uh, Bacteriophages are actually being used as an alternative. That is true, yes. 
Okay, so for the next question from Mr. Antonio C. De Guzman. So, doctor, is it possible to use a specific virus that acts as a bacteriophage to stop a sepsis caused by bacteria such as E. coli or S. pneumonia? Mm. Yes, is the answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. I, I, bacteriophage is something that I uh, do not really work on, but I would, yeah, I think, yeah, the answer is yes. Okay, so another question from Mr. Cesar. Can humans become a mixing vessel just like swine? In the case of influenza virus to other forms of animal? Yes, definitely. Swine is a very good uh, mixing vessel for influenza. And um, genetically, we're very, very close to uh, pigs. And so the, the possibility of viruses transferring from pigs to humans is quite high. Although for this to really happen, it will take um, not millions of years, but several mutations. So once when I was in Korea and there was a, an influenza pandemic, we were thinking that it could be, it could easily transfer just because of the, the idea of mixing vessel. It is possible, but the possibility is really very tiny. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mayara. So we have another question from Zoom from Sir John Anthony. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, can inactivating VTMs affect the result of an RT-PCR test? <laughs> so um, the media that we use to inactivate uh, swab samples for SARS should not really affect uh, the your the RNA the PCR tests okay um, it is important but there are several factors that could affect one sample is collected and they are processed immediately like for example within 48 hours or 72 hours for some media there should be no effect in the ability of the RT-PCR to detect a positive, uh, positive sample. If the sample has not been collected properly, it's not been stored properly, then there is a very high likelihood that the PCR test will be uh, tested negative just because of the process that the went wrong. But so as long as the sample is collected properly, it's been immediately processed and uh, and immediately being processed, uh, 48 to 72 hours should not really affect the RT-PCR test. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Myra. So in the interest of time, we'll be ending the Q&A session now. So for the remaining questions, don't worry, because we will be raising these questions on Friday, October 15, during the second part of this webinar. So this concludes the first day of our two-day webinar. Please be reminded that the evaluation form will be given on Friday after the second day discussion. The evaluation form is required before you can secure a copy of the certificate and a copy of the presentation as well. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Hosmilio, all our distinguished guests, and of course, all of our participants for today. See you on Friday, Po. Just log in to the Zoom link provided for Friday. See you on the same Facebook page and same YouTube channel. So this has been Irish Kulinasin of the OSD ITDI. Good afternoon, everyone, at maraming salaman po for tuning in. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Tumitilaot na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit 
sa bayan ng aming hati. Tana, kaibigan, huwag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo. Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan sa pamangkakas. Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susuro At ikabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Ingabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrisyon. 